time I came over and said hi. But this is nice. This is, is nice to sit down and have a proper chat. It know. is, man. It is. And a, a lot to talk about. I do have one other um, weird connection to you, just because it's a great sentence. Um, one of my friends once carried you down Whitehall on his shoulders okay. with a camera strapped to you performing poetry during a demonstration. <laughs> I thought you were going to talk. I thought this was going to go somewhere completely different. I oh, really? He carried me on his shoulders. Like, oh, what was I doing? Oh, <laughs> no, no. oh no. Well, how drunk was I? <laughs> okay, that's good. I feel better about that. Yeah, I yeah. was working. I was working. Okay. Yeah, we were sort of making... It was with Toby as well, actually. We were making a sort of, uh, a, a sort of art film for uh -huh. to with Toby. And uh, yeah, we sort of went down to some of the protests that were happening with the Extinction, Re Extinction Rebellion protests that were happening at the time. We just wanted to sort of get that kind of atmosphere and that sort of energy behind the sort of the poem that we were sort of creating. Yeah, It's incredible. That takes a bit of confidence, though. Not just But it was quite weird because a few people sort of recognised me and I'm sort of just <laughs> I was gonna say. hanging off some poor dude's <laughs> shoulders as we marched down. <laughs> yeah, I saw the photos. It looks, it looks interesting. Is that out then? Did the video, was it released? No, we were sort of playing around with it. It was, just, it was just a chance to get sort of creative and hang out and me and Toby to sort of do something together. And I'd sort of written, I wrote quite a bit of poetry and... Mm. And yeah, we just sort of thought, let's try and make something visual that sort of ca captures all these sort of words and lyrics and stuff. And so we were just messing around with the camera, really. Wow. And we'll, we sort of continue to do that with, if and when we're sort of in the same city at the same time. Because, you, I mean, like, like you say, you do you do, do a, a lot of different things. I mean, for want of a cliche, strings to your bow. Like you, you write poetry, perform poetry, yeah. act, yeah. you're a musician. And that's about it. <laughs> but that's still, that still, that, that makes you, I guess in, in industry parlance, that makes you a triple threat. Does it? Right, okay. I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Is that what they call people with a... Um, that sounds good. I like it, yeah. I'm, oh, I'll refer to you as a triple threat okay. from now on. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's great. But mu I'm right in thinking, before acting took off, yeah. music was um, your first love. That's what you uh, initially started doing and, and wanted to pursue. It sort of was, yeah. I mean, it, it, people say that, but it was, it was always both, actually. Mm. It was always just film and music. I was just sort of obsessed and had a huge love for, for both, you know, and had always sort of played around with both. And, and yeah, sort of music, you know, since I was about 15, I think I started writing music. I sort of joined my first band as you do when you're yeah. just sort of kids hanging around with nothing to do. And we sort of took it seriously. You know, we were into it. Like yeah. it, was, it sort of consumed my life at that age. And, uh, you know, we sort of, then it, it just sort of progressed from there. And then, but I was always interested in film and I was always interested in acting. And, and the paths have always sort of woven themselves through my life yeah. at I'm various different stages where one's felt more important than the other or one's been more present in my life than the other. And any time I try and make a sort of plan to do one, the other ends up happening more than the, than the one I was trying to sort of figure out, you know. What was your first band called? Do you remember? The first? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I had nothing to do with it because the band had already sort of formed before I sort of joined. I was the sort of last member to join. And at that point, I mean, we were 15. It was called Baker Required. <laughs> Baker Required. And the story, I believe, like I said, I wasn't there, but the story was that they were trying to think of a name. Nobody could sort of come up with anything. So you do the thing of like, well, let's just say the first thing that we see, they were standing outside a bakery, I imagine. <laughs> and, and there it was. And then that got, we then it got really into like bands like The Small Faces and they had this song called Song of a Baker. Okay. So we shortened it as we got a bit older, we sort of shortened the, the name to, to Baker. Okay. So that, that was it. But I mean, yeah, we were kids. We, it was just a sort of... But it's, I, I, was yeah. in a, I was in a band as well at that age. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's a really exciting thing to It's to so do. important to you at that time, mm. you know, and we didn't think of anything else. It was just like a gang and we had a group of sort of mates that all sort of followed the band and we would go... We would do gigs in pubs and I was only about 15, 16 years old, which is crazy now when you think about it. Yeah. You, know, that I, you know, my dad would sort of drive us all over to the gigs or someone else's dad, we'd all jump in a van... And yeah, and you would sort of play <laughs> to another group, to a vast room full of underage drinkers. <laughs> and we somehow got away with it. I don't know how. Um, and it was original songs though, not covers or covers as well. We did sort of both, but we oh. were really into songwriting. I mean, that really, yeah, mm. me and the guitar player got really sort of into that. And mm. we, we would, yeah, we, we watched a lot of skateboarding videos and we would sort of try and emulate a lot of the music that was coming off these sort of skate vids that we watched. So, uh, and so it was quite eclectic in that way because skate videos have a lot of different types yeah. of music and it was sort of punky in times and then it was more sort of so laid back. And then the music changed as our, our tastes changed, you know. 
Like, so I guess, was it coming off the back of that new wave punk sort of, like Green Day, Sum 41, or was it earlier than that? No, it was sort of, I mean, we were never, that was sort of a bit poppy and cheesy, but right. we were into sort of bad brains and stuff okay. like that, you know. Yeah, and then we sort of got into sort of the English bands, like Senseless Things and Mega <laughs> City 4 and Ned's Atomic Dustbin <laughs> yeah. and Carter USM oh. and that, all, all that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's, you're talking, you're talking my era of music. Like, I mean, Carter USM, Carter, I think yeah, one of the huge. first albums that I got into, because like, as, a, as a kid kid, it was all Queen. That was pretty exclusively what right, I listened right, to. Right. And then around the early 90s, 101 Damnations came right. along, 30-something, yeah, yeah, yeah. the amazing, car album. Amazing. And still amazing records, man. Yeah, they the are. The lyrics in those albums, I mean, I think they hugely inspired my sort of love of lyrics, I mm. think. Yeah, yeah, Jim Bob was an, an incredible lyricist. Yeah, he was. He really? Was. Yeah. Oh, it's great. And Tommy doesn't. Did you ever, one of the bands that I love, Pop Polite itself? Massive. Love that. <laughs> love that. Oh. Had the tea on because we used to wear the band t shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Used to get down at HMV in Guildford. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah. yeah. And then we just, yeah, then we started getting more. I mean, the Beastie Boys sort of came into my life yeah. around that sort of time as well. Mm. Check Your Head was a sort of huge record for me because my brother was always really into sort of hip hop music, my older brother. Mm. And then my mates were more sort of into sort of guitar music. So I sort of had a palette of both, you know. And so when the sort of Beastie Boys came along and they were sort of rappers that played their own instruments and sort of jammed and had all these like amazing sort of funk tracks with mm. all this. And then they do some punk track. And it was kind of like the music that we were listening to off the skate videos, but it was all sort of condensed into one band, you know. Yeah. So that just sort of, poof, just sort of blew everything yeah. up. I remember uh, Sure Shot, that Beastie Boys song, Sure Shot. Yeah. Uh, and I just remember it was great because, like, to, I was not I was not able to dance as a kid. Like, so like the indie scene was great, but then sure shot you could just sort of shuffle around the floor, and that was dancing to that song. And you it could was throw like, yourself around, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, it was great. But I, I was, I think we're about the, I think we're about the same age, maybe a, a year difference, and that would make you around. I'm guessing sixteen, seventeen, about ninety five. Which was the yes. height yeah, it was an of amazing Britpop. time. Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, I mean, you which know. is the time you want to be. Right. You know, 16 is when music means everything mm. to you. So when you're seeing all these bands sort of coming in and you just idolized, you know, you just sort of looked up to that mm. so massively, you know. I mean, like, that was, that was when, I mean, like, I think Cool Britannia, that, that happened just a little bit later, sort of when Labour got it in 97. But, you know, just before then, 95, that was when. You know, we were like the, the country was this sort of powerhouse of music again. And it was we were the coolest country in the world. And it yeah. was when Oasis and Blur was sort of on the front pages of all the red tops, like who's going to be number one role with it or country house. And it was just an exciting time to be 16, 17 years old. Yeah, it really was. Who, and, who, who, which corner were you in? Just I mean, it's a it's it's a it's a question. It is, no, and it, you know, it Blur was, Oasis. it was difficult because I didn't like the Blur song that came out. Country House is not their finest hour in the video. And I, I couldn't sort of stand behind it. Do you know what mm. I mean? But I was a Blur fan and I was an Oasis fan. But I was sort of into the sort of Manchester thing probably more than I was the Blur thing at that time. Yeah. That sounds like you, you, know, like you, you sort, of, sort of saying Oasis in a roundabout way. I think Oasis, but I didn't love either song. <laughs> like, they yeah. weren't, but no, Country House, I just couldn't kind of get behind it as a, as a, as a track, you know. Yeah. But Damon Albarn's someone that sort of soundtracks pretty much my entire life and has sort of continues to do so with mm. his stuff with the Gorillas and yeah. his own stuff. And he's, you know, he's, he's, you know, a musical force definitely for our times. Because you went to, you, you, like you mentioned the Manchester scene and being into like, you know, that Manchester music scene. That, I, I mean, I, I'm sort of putting words in your mouth slightly, but it sounds to me like part of the reason you moved to Manchester for uni was to be part of that scene. Yeah, it was 100% that. Yeah. It was. I was sort of trying to find something to do. My mum was sort of desperately trying to get me into university. I was working in a restaurant at the time. I'd sort of taken a year out from finishing college. Most people go travelling and do some exotic things. Right. And I worked as a pot wash boy in a restaurant and smoked a load of weed. <laughs> <laughs> that was about all I did it does. And, I, and I think my mum was sort of like you've got to try to do so and I realised that you know I had to sort of move on when I got promoted to the salad uh, to salad boy from potwash boy to salad boy <laughs> which meant that I was in charge of sort of prawn cocktails and you know all these hor horrible sort of salads and I was so excited about this promotion 
I realised I needed to rethink my life <laughs> and maybe have another another yeah. crack at life. But my mum was sort of like, "You have to do something. You've got to do something. You like you can't just hang around here." What and are I, you talking about, mum? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm making salads now. Prawn cocktail. <laughs> that's a big ask. You know, that's not that's working with fish. <laughs> that is a special skill. But also at that time, I remember because I like, I thought I was just going to be in a band, yeah. and I thought the band that I was in at that time, that's what we were going to do. But all the other members of the band went off to university or to go and do something else. Oh, so I was sort of left in just sort of going, oh, I thought we were going to be doing this. And so everybody moment. sort of spread off. And so I just sort of hung around washing dishes for a year. Yeah. So I was sort of, when, when that time sort of came to sort of find something to do, I looked into maybe doing some sort of music courses and realized that wasn't what I wanted to do at all. Mm. You know, it felt really, I didn't want to turn it into a sort of academic thing. It was a sort of, it was a reaction against all that stuff, you know. And so, yeah, we, I sort of found this course in Manchester and I thought, and it was a kind of, it was called media performance and it was kind of, you did some TV acting, you did some theatre production, you did some boom operating, video editing. Right. You sort of did a Hands bit of Hands-on stuff. It was full of people that didn't know what they wanted to do with their <laughs> life. <laughs> like, I have no idea a, what I want, so I'll try this board, course. A yeah, yeah. smorgasbord of various I mean, sort of yeah. skills, yeah. Anything you could imagine, it was sort of in there. But, but it was in Manchester, and I yeah. thought, right, I'll go to Manchester, and I, I'll find some people, and I'll start a new band. That was sort of where my head was kind of at. And I got there... And I'd, I'd always been interested in acting, like I said, and I'd done some sort of theatre stuff as, as, a, as a younger kid and, and th drama classes were always the thing I sort of excelled in at school. And I suddenly found myself sort of in a course doing things that I was good at and that I really liked and that I could really sort of focus on. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sort of was introduced to sort of British cinema, I think. I met some sort of people in Manchester that were into movies and and taught me a load of stuff about English film directors and different films. And, and I suddenly started seeing film in a whole sort of different and new, exciting way. And this is... This is so then I forgot about music completely. Then I just completely sort of was like, right, I'm into this. And I started making my own short films and putting on our own plays. And the course ended up being amazing for me, not for everybody, but <laughs> it, was, it, it was great. And it was a bit like a sort of rough sort of fame academy in a way. A rough fame academy. I mean, it was in Salford in Manchester right, right, for a right. start. Yeah, I was you know, once chased out of a primary school by primary school kids in yeah. Salford No, the kids are the ones you got to watch out <laughs> Oh, for, man. man, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're lawless. Yeah, mm. But it was crazy. It was a crazy time. But, but yeah, it was this quite sort of rough sort of place. And it was just full of, like, people that wanted to be actors, people that wanted to score music for film, people that wanted to be dancers. I mean, it was just this big building full of all these people, you know. And you sort of realise that you could sort of really utilise that and sort of live this almost sort of fake industry existence in this sort of mad building. And you could put notices up saying, I'm making a short film, I need an actor, and I need someone to write some music for it. And people would answer and you would start making your own, your own work and sort of generating your own work. So it was a really, for me, like a really prolific and really exciting creative time. And so then... Then, you, like you say, you leave music behind. Are you down in London at that point? You put Manchester behind you and you moved no, down I was, to I London. Was, I was living in Manchester. And when I was there, after the sort of court, as part of the course, and then after, I, I wrote a play, a one-person show mm -hmm. while I was there. And it was a sort of collection of mad things I had written in my notebook, poems. <clears throat> and I sort of managed to sort of put it all together and, and make a sort of somewhat sense sensical piece of <laughs> theatre and I was really lucky like someone saw me in the crowd uh, he was an actor a professional actor and he came up to me after the show and he said you know you should really think about being an actor you should really think about finding an agent and I can help you do that and I didn't know what an agent was I had no idea how to become a professional actor I was just doing the course and I was just into th this whatever it was sort of creatively and uh and so he gave me the number of an agent in London. And so I thought, right. And he said, well, This is a nice guy. Like, he's yeah, an amazing guy. I owe him my life, basically. Yeah. You, and and he knows that. I've okay. told him many times. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, he, he, doesn't knows. he doesn't He doesn't bring it up or you but does he ever go, listen. No, do... he's very cool. I always sort of bring yeah, I always make sure he knows that he that was the turning point in my life. And you're still sure. friends then? I still, we have the same agent because okay. it was his agent that he recommended me to. Yeah. What a nice thing to do. That's a really yeah. nice gesture. Good, 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 good guy. So I sort of 
did. I just sort of phoned this woman. Had he not done that, I would. I don't believe I would have known how to even follow that path. Mm. You know, and I think in England, if you haven't been a sort of drama, it's quite difficult to get an agent unless sure. you really yeah. know and you're focused on sort of trying to. And get And being that. in London as well, it's sort of it is. You know, I mean, yeah. it's changing now, uh, but it's a. It's still kind of a London centric industry. Yeah, it's, it was it's quite where exclusive. The, yeah, the auditions take place and yeah. you meet people and all that, the networking that goes with it and all yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. That gubbins. So no, he said, you know, go and meet this woman. So I called her and she said, we'll come to London and we'll have a meeting. And so we did that. And then she said, okay, if you're really serious about doing this, um, you should move back to London. Hmm. So I was like, all right, cool. So I moved back to London thinking I was going to take off as an actor. And I did some jobs and I did. And there was quite a lot of work sort of happening. Bits and pieces. The first job I ever got was a Pizza Hut commercial. <laughs> Really? Directed by Edgar Wright. What? Yeah, which is, it was his first. I think I've seen that. I think that's online somewhere. <laughs> oh my know. God. And we've been friends, so we know each other and see each other and laugh about that often. You know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so, a yeah, great so Edgar then, connection. I was there. just sort of doing bits and pieces. I was just sort of working as a working actor, you know, just trying yeah. to sort of find your way. And then I ended up joining a band back in London. Yeah. So then music became a big part of my life again. And then the acting sort of. Well, I mean, the acting, like, obviously you've got uh, season two of Home Before Dark. Uh, it's just started, I think, last week. It's uh, started on June the 11th. Every Friday, a new episode drops on Apple TV+. Plus. That's it. It is, uh, like I said, season two. So I, I binged uh, the first season. Did you? Uh, yeah. I did. It's, um, it's, <clears throat> we'll talk about it. Before we talk about season um too because how did you get involved in it to begin with did, did, did they send you a script was it a meeting yeah they sent over a script uh with a sort of cover letter saying that they would love me to meet with the team that was sort of putting it together and i sort of saw on the blurb that they'd write that it was starring this girl brooklyn prince mm. and i'd just seen a movie that she was in a film called the florida project mm. I may have seen it maybe a month before Great and that film, girl had it? stuck in my mind. I yeah. was like, that girl is absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I loved the film and I loved her performance in it. So when I saw that it was her playing this young girl and it was a very sort of special sort of relationship, father-daughter kind of story, I thought, okay, that looks like something that could be, could be interesting. You know, and it was directed by John Chu, who had just come off the back of Crazy Rich Asians. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll sort of go and sort of investigate a little further. So they flew me to Los Angeles to sort of do a screen test chemistry meet. With Brooklyn. With Brooklyn, right. which is terrifying. I mean, it's <laughs> terrifying enough as it is doing those things. Normally it's for a sort of romantic connection. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That you do it with a sort of leading mm. lady or something. Um, but to do it with an eight-year-old girl at the time... You know, I mean, so she'd already been cast at this she point. She was cast right. and they were trying to find someone to play her dad. Okay. Yeah. And so I flew to Los Angeles. I met with her mum and I met with the producers and the writers and the director and, you know, various other people. And then they kind of, after about 15 minutes, they said, right, we're going to bring in Brooklyn, you know, and she sort of appeared in a sort of dry ice, <laughs> rose from the floor, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah, and it was terrifying because kids don't have a filter like that. You know, yeah. if, you, if you don't get along, they're not, they're going to let you know about it. There's yeah. no sort of pretend, you know, they, they're not sort of, it was, wasn't it W W C Fields who said never work with children and animals? Right. I mean, like, but I mean, obviously, you know, this is it, it must be very different to your regular kind of acting relationship with someone. Yeah. Well, it was at the beginning. I mean, I was nervous because whoever played that character, and I knew that Brooklyn was amazing in the Florida projects, but I sort of knew that the director was great at just sort of capturing that raw energy yeah. of these kids and sort of letting them run around. And he filmed it, and it was. You know, there's a lot of improvisation in that particular film. And for this, it would really required an amazing actress. I mean, somebody that really kind of could go to all these emotional places and, mm. and you know, remember tons of lines. And it, it wasn't quite the same style of, of film, you know. And she just blew my mind and continues to blow my mind. And, you know, I work with her very closely and I've watched her sort of grow and we've become very close over the years. She's incredible in it. And like, because it's a, yeah. it, I, I honestly think it, it's it's not an easy part because you know because there is a, a danger of that character because you're, you're, a, you're like you say an eight year old kid. The character is kind of like very confident. Yeah. Very. Um, uh, she speaks her mind. You know, you could easily find yourself with a precocious child who you're like, mm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, doing yeah. That. And she walks that line so well that Absolutely, you, yeah, you really you you buy into um, this character because she's she's based on a real. A uh, person, a nine-year-old journalist called Hildy Lyshak, I think. Lysiak. Lysiak, is, so, is yeah, it pronounced? Lysiak, yeah. yeah. 
Um, which which is, I didn't know going in, actually. I mean, I sort of, I read maybe two scripts and then you have to sort of make your decision. I didn't realise it was all based on, on truth. Yeah. You know? So when you discover that as an actor and you sort of, you're enjoying the sort of material anyway, mm. and then it's like, well, this is all true. This, these people really exist. And you were kind of like, because I, I, when I first heard about it, before I'd watched it, I was like, how, how is this going to work? Like, that was my initial reaction to, yeah. the, to the idea of this very dark, adult murder mystery with there's a child being kidnapped possibly yeah. murdered uh and then your protagonist is you know a nine-year-old kid and you're like these two genres are they are they going to work and it's amazing how well they go together yeah that's great i mean that was something that we were all quite nervous about and and conscious of mm -hmm. you know and the sort of showrunners and the producers and everybody really sort of managed to weave a really interesting mm sort of balance between the darkness and the sort of and then you th joyfulness of it as exactly. well. You're sort of seeing the adult world, which it was, we all know is a fairly messed up place, but you're seeing the adult world through the eyes of sort of young kids, and, but it's not filtered, you know, it's not sort of mm. showing the world as, as this sort of sweet, squeaky clean, colourful landscape. You know, it's, it's, it's all there for the kids to absorb and to, to be a part of. And you think back to the kind of movies that I'm sure you loved as a kid that I, I loved, and actually... They, a lot of the movies that we liked were this kind of thing. You look at something, I think it was Stand By Me that popped into yeah, my head. Yeah, I was yeah. like, well, you know, like, obviously the kids are slightly older in that, but it is, you know, it's a, a, a kid's been killed and they're on this adventure, yeah, you know, and yeah. there's hijinks and whatever, but the undertone is they're going to see a body at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that was definitely the time we were talking, you know, when they were sort of pitching the film and talking about it, you know, those kind of Amblin movies, mm. those older films, Stand By Me definitely came mm. up a lot. Yeah. E.T., um, Goonies, a sort of mix of all that sort of stuff, you know, mm. with a sort of true crime drama of a sort of Netflix documentary or something. <laughs> it's really dark. Yeah. yeah, but it's great. So you, uh, it's, I, do you know what I like as well? I'm really into um, into shows that transport you somewhere, and you really do spend uh, a, a lot of season one and, and indeed the start of season two. Um, you know, it, it, you feel like you've been moved to this small town, yeah. America. Yeah, you know, Erie Harbor as it's called in the movie. But it's you actually shoot in Vancouver. We shoot in Vancouver, yeah. So yeah. I mean, I've been to Vancouver, and I can't, I can't play. So it's, it must be just outside Vancouver, or like, cause yeah, it, it's very. I mean, Vancouver's got quite a lot of places where you can sort of create small towns that could be kind of anywhere, mm. you know. And how long are you there then? Like, are you there? Are you? Do you go back and forth? Or once you're there, you do the whole series and do then... the whole series. Yeah. So I mean, the, <clears throat> it's ten episodes, so that usually takes around five six months to shoot. Uh -huh. This year was a slightly different experience because of, of COVID. And, mm. you know, we sort of got there expecting a sort of, you know, I remember leaving the house in London, kind of thinking, oh, here we go, going for a sort of, you know, a long time because five, six months is yeah. a long time. Little did I know that a year and a half later I would be coming back. You know? <laughs> is we, that how long? Wait, you've been away a year and I a was, half? I was in Vancouver for a year and a half. Yeah, oh we, my we, God. we started the show. I think it, we got to about the third episode, third or fourth episode. Uh-huh. And we got shut down as everybody sort of did and work sort of stopped. And we all sort of made the decision that we would stay. You know, we'd all sort of moved anyway and we'd sort of found ourselves accommodation in Vancouver and I'd rented out my place in London. And it was just like no one quite knew how long it was going to go on for. Mm. So we were sort of, in a nice way, all the cast decided that we would all stay in Vancouver and we would just sort of That's ride funny. it out and see how long it came. <laughs> and then we ended up just like... So you've been away a year and a half, and how long yeah. have you? How long have you been back then? I've been back just over a month. Now. Oh my god! Yeah. So it's yeah. like, it's, how how is it being home? It's a mate. Yeah. Well, the sun's come out. Yeah. So yeah, it feels like you're sort of having a, a sort of vacation in your own city because it's it's an it's an amazing feeling to miss your own city. Mm. That's something that's quite rare, actually. Normally, you're sort of desperate to kind of get out, you know, and fight, get have a holiday, travel, and just see sort of the world, travel, yeah, exactly, yeah. just do anything but stay stay in town and so yeah it was it, it's been really nice sort of seeing it through sort of fresh eyes again and now the sun london's always beautiful when the sun's out it's, it's amazing at the moment yeah, yeah. And, we got and i miss the pubs and i sort of came back just in time for the pubs to sort of slightly mm. reopen yeah it was almost like i timed it perfectly <laughs> but it, it was nothing to do yeah Oh, so what was it like? What, were you, so were you there with your family? Did you take your family out there? Or? Well, I left. I left with my wife, and I came back with a family. So oh I had my a, god! I had a baby boy while I was out there. Wow! So yeah, we were there so long. Big year and a I, half. Lot of I stuff. I ended up having a child while we were there. Yeah, which was mad. Which we we weren't expecting at all. So it was. It was hey, congratulations! Thank man. you very much. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And um, and what was it like walking back through your front door? Because I get when I'm I've never been away for a year and a half, but you know. When you're away for a long time 
and you walk back through your front door, it's you do. There's a special feeling. It really. I mean, if I could bottle that feeling when we did it, because it was, yeah, just I think having the our baby and and bringing him home mm. was just such a monumental feeling. We'd been sort of staying in Airbnbs, and I ended up shooting a film in New York before I came home. So we were in hotels, and he was in a pop up cot, and that had sort of become our life. We were sort of we were accustomed to that, this sort of nomadic sort of traveling on the road sort of lifestyle. And we got home and you sort of put the key through the door and you bring your new boy back into this, you know, into the nest, you know, into the, into the actual home yeah. and to set up his bedroom and to sort of make it his. And it was just really quite beautiful. It was amazing. amazing. Yeah. I wonder if he's one of the, the youngest people on the planet to have that many stamps in his passport. <laughs> <laughs> he'd done well, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he'd been to New York. He loved New York. <laughs> he was just looking around like that, just fucking wide eyed, just having the best wow. time ever. Oh, amazing. Um, so, what are you, so are you on downtime now? Have you got a little bit of time to yourself? What, what is your what is your down? How does your downtime play out? Is it just yeah, seen? I've been. It's definitely some downtime. Yeah, yeah, it was quite a long sort of trek with the Vancouver job and finishing off the show because, like I said, we had to wait for such a long time. We did the whole summer in Vancouver, none of us sort of working, and then we had to finish it off. And we had seven episodes still to go, so it's still we were there a long time. Yeah. Then I yeah. Then I went and shot a film in New York. And so I was sort of, I was done, you know, yeah. So it's just nice to be home and just have a bit of time and know that you've got nothing on the horizon. That's sort of, Because I'm one of those people, the minute I know it's there, even if it's like three months away, start my brain's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just start kind of plotting it, planning it, thinking about it, stressing about and it, all getting the mechanics excited about of it, it, you know, moving, moving where I'm going to be, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nice to just have a <laughs> empty horizon for the time being must have been great for i'm imagining it must have been nice for the cat you've got some great cat like as well as uh brooklyn you've got abby miller in there yeah, uh, louis lovely louis hertham yeah abby miller i thought she was great in the center louis hertham we know from westworld yeah in terms of you know it being uh the atmosphere on the set being like a very tight-knit kind of family community a year and a half in the same place is going to do that yeah yeah well it was it was amazing to sort of go back having experienced something real together mm. you know we'd all sort of really had this monumental life experience that we'd all sort of got got each other through in that way so when we sort of came back to filming it felt like the family dynamic had just been enriched and just felt more sort of grounded you know we weren't sort of pretending as much we really knew each other we really had been through something together so that all really sort of played into it in a nice way in an interesting way i'm excited i mean i am excited I'm, like i said i've just and started. abby had a baby too oh, really yeah yeah <laughs> so I had two pregnant wives it was kind of a bit of a mind bend <laughs> who ended up becoming very good friends it's like, this is all very weird this is all bending my head a little bit <laughs> what's the line reality <laughs> fiction what's going on yeah. um so this is, I, I'm, I'm th I think this is probably, in terms of the, the scale, uh, the biggest TV series you've done. Because, um, I mean, primarily your career has been uh, in film. Yeah. But, I, I mean, the, the landscape has changed. You know, in the last decade, like TV, now we are in this golden age of TV where, you know, the difference between the quality of, of, of a TV show and, uh, and a film is, is almost negligible. And, and yeah. the budgets, did this feel... I mean, being one of the biggest that I think you've done, did this feel different on set? Could you sort of, did it, was the gap between you being on a film set and you being on the set of Home Before Dark, like noticeably smaller? Yeah, it did. They, they build a lot of the sets mm. and you always know you're in a big production when they build the set, you know? <laughs> and so that felt, it just felt very sort of professional, you know, and, and, and I think for one of the Apple shows, it's not one of their big spenders, but it's still a big yeah, it show. it's great. Yeah, yeah, they do a really good job of it. Um, yeah, it did. It, it, felt, it felt like it was... From certainly doing sort of a lot of independent films, you felt like you were in something that was sort of big and impactful. I mean, I've been in some big movies too, where they build some sort of giant, giant, giant sets. But it was yeah. nice that we had this house that was built in a studio and it became sort of home, you know, and it's sort of... we were. Like, we would just hang out there. We would all hang out in the kitchen and play cards in between takes and sort of, you know, the home sort of felt very real for us, you know. To talk about your films though, I mean, like your, the, your first, the, the first sort of big film that you did um, across the universe, uh, it was uh, Julie Tamer. She'd just come off the back of Frida. I think it was a follow-up film to Frida. Yeah, that's right. And it's, uh, it's, it's huge sort of musical using the songs of the Beatles. Um, like, 
when that came along, did because you'd been, I think you'd been sort of you'd done you'd done your stint as a lot of British actors do on a sort of staples of British UK drama, UK yeah. drama like <clears> um, <throat> like uh, I think like Heartbeat, I think, and uh, yeah, and yeah, Judge John, Judge Dee, John, Dee, Touch, Dee, of Frost. Touch of Frost, yeah, yeah. and yeah. then this comes along. Um, you auditioned for it, I imagine. I did, yeah. There was a crazy audition process, a really crazy, a bit like a sort of American Idol or something like that. So you, were, <clears throat> I, you were obviously singing in the audition as well. Yeah, it was a sort of big open casting. Um, someone just told me because the, the band that I was in, a different band, not not the Baker band, but another <laughs> band. When I was in London, um, which we'd been doing for about four years, and that had sort of become my life. Really, was just playing music again. And uh, I've been doing a few bits and pieces as an actor, but I was not inspired by it. I wasn't getting anything work-wise that was particularly interesting. I remember one of the last jobs that I had in that stint, I sort of, I played a guy who set himself on fire in a public toilet <laughs> okay. and ran through a pub naked. And I was like, I think I'm going to give this up. I think, I think this acting gig is That'll just not it. interesting to me anymore. <laughs> And, I was, and so I was really close to sort of packing it all in. And someone said to me, like, you should, you know, because the band had just sort of split up as well. And someone said, you should go up for this Beatles thing, man. You should go and check it out. And I was like, what is it? And they said, oh, they're making a Beatles musical. Yeah. And most people <clears throat> from England anyway, sort of turn their nose up at that a little bit. And just sort of really? maybe have a mm, musical with the Beatles. Not sure about that. Musical theatre, the Beatles, right. rock and roll. I'm not sure that all sort of Oh, I see together. you mean putting the Beatles as a musical, right? Yeah, and I was sort of in a band and I took music very seriously right. and sort of making a musical with sort of, you know, a West Endy sort of Broadway type mm -hmm. thing. That's what my mind sort of yeah. conjured, conjured up, you know. But I had nothing really going on. Like I said, I just set myself on fire and covered myself in petrol. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, all right, I'll go and I'll go and sort of, you know, see what it's all about. And so I sort of, yeah, I, I turned up with a fairly sort of not arrogant at all, but I just wasn't bothered about what was proved to me that this is going to be a good film. Yeah, I wasn't nervous. Right. You know, normally I'd be quite nervous, but I was so sort of like, oh, I'm not sure what this is. I'll just go along. Uh -huh. And I think that sort of got me through it because I just had no, and I, they sort of saw that, maybe that bit of that attitude and what I was sort of bringing into the room. <laughs> They're like, we want that guy who doesn't <laughs> give a fuck at all. Isn't it, isn't it awful <laughs> that the stuff that you go for where you don't give where you a fuck, care, yeah, yeah. it's like you, you get. And you, then, you and then, you well, just complete yeah. sort of, I know. It's awful when you're like, I really want this. And they're like, he wants it. No, absolutely not. We don't want him. And it was, I, they, they made us sing a few Beatles songs. I took my guitar and I sort of, they, that was all they asked was to sing a couple of Beatles What did you songs. sing? Do you remember? I remember. I think we had to sing Strawberry Fields Forever. Okay. And I think, and then one of my, or oh, your own, and I think I sang like Mean Mr. Mustard or something like that. <laughs> so did you walk out going, I think I might have nailed that? Did you? Not at all, no. Oh. No, I didn't know. I mean, all I knew, there was sort of lines of people and you could hear people singing sort of Revolution, but, but in a really West End sort of version <laughs> of it. And that that was, awful. It was awful, yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I sort of left. I didn't really think much of it. And then I got a call back saying, we'd love you to come back. Uh -huh. Could you not bring your guitar? Because we're going to do some workshops singing. Because to me, singing was always with a microphone or an instrument. Mm. But they wanted you to sort of act and sing at the same time, mm. <clears throat> which was a bit weird. You know, you're sort of having to look people in the eyes and sort of do it yeah, as though yeah, it's yeah. a sort of extension of dialogue or whatever. And then so they made me do some acting and say, can you do a Liverpool accent? And so I did that. And then... I think I went back maybe two or three times in London. And then they said, okay, we're going to send you to New York to meet the director. And I was like, what? What is this an American film? Mm. They're like, yeah, yeah, this is an American film. I was like, well, who's making it then? I was like, oh, this is a Sony picture. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, who's who's the director? And they said, oh, it's Julie Taymor. And I was like, I know her. Like, she did Frida, like yeah. you said, which I loved, and Titus, which yeah. was just visually beautiful. And yeah. I knew she'd created The Lion King, which is stunning to look at. And and then I was like, oh, shit, like, this could be sort of quite... I thought I might be playing, like, Paul McCartney or George Harris, you know, in some <laughs> snappy little <laughs> musical. <laughs> Um, so at this point, you still don't know the the, vi the vision that they have for this film, no which, is, which just, is not that at all, is no, it? It's, not like, at it's all. a much cooler, a much cooler yeah, film. Yeah, I mean, the film itself is all about the sort of Vietnam War, mm. and it, it, it no one's playing John, Paul, George, or Ringo. It's All the characters are from Beatles songs. Mm. So there was a Jude and a Lucy and a Jojo and a Maxwell and Sadie and all that stuff. Um, 
so yeah then i got nervous then i freaked out and then we sort of there was a bunch of us that all went to sort of new york at the same time and julie sort of she works in theater so she did a so lot you, of you're still alongside other people auditioning this isn't you yeah. haven't got the job no, at the no moment, at right? all. there was sort of quite a big group of us that went to new york uh -huh. from england to sort of workshop with julie and slowly we sort of got sent home you know <laughs> and it was sort of me and some other guy um that were left we were the sort of last two standing and then I remember I sort of went into the room and I was like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to do everything I can to get this. I'm not going to get nervous. I'm just going to give it everything I've got. And then I came back to London. I remember I was sitting in a pub in London and the phone rang and it was Julie Taymor sitting in a New York cab. And she was like, we, we, we want you to play the part. We want you. And I was like, what? And just like, yeah, so it was crazy. It was really crazy. That moment, though, that, was, that yeah. must be sort of seared into your brain, the moment that you get that call in a London pub and suddenly it's like... Yeah, um, and it was another one of those moments, the one with the play and with the actor who came up to me at the right. end and sort of said, you know, you should phone this woman. That was one sort of pivotal moment. And this was definitely another where it was, a, you know, a whole new sort of thing sort of opened up. And I, I sort of knew because... Yeah, like I said, I'd sort of been playing music and I've been in a band and I and even a lot of the people that I knew from Camden and sort of music world were all like, what, are you going to make a musical? <laughs> yeah. And I remember thinking, you know what, I'm just going to forget all that stuff and I'm going to go and just have the experience as best as I can sort of take it on mm. and just put all that sort of energy to one side, you know? Yeah. And because uh, you and can't listen to people when something like that, but you know, I mean, no. you know, of course, you have a, a, a sort of close knit few who are like normally quite supportive, but people, you know, no, there was the guy down the pub. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, He's yeah. probably still down that pub, just sort of <laughs> whinging about the music yeah. scene and about yeah. the authenticity of bands yeah. these days yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and you're part like, of the furniture there. He's like, yeah, let me yeah, tell yeah. you how it used to be. <laughs> music. It's like you know, where you always. He's still there <laughs> trying to trying to get his album out. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um. That's a, that, that is a movie. I mean, but yeah, we went to New York, and I, you know, I'd never been to America. That was it, and it was just I was living in New York, and we were making this film, and and the whole process of that film was about a nine month process. Uh -huh. So yeah, it was it was life changing for me. I was going to say that when you say life changing, I mean it, every. I mean, it did change everything for you, didn't it? Being in that movie, in terms of like. I, you know, it's a, again, it's a, you know, it's a, a phrase that's used uh, a lot. But I mean, you've never really looked back after that. You've worked like to look at your CV. Uh, you have worked. You've met, had a movie out every year since. Um, yeah. Since it's across been, the universe came out. Yeah, it was it was a whirlwind. Certainly at the beginning, it was it was yeah. really crazy. Yeah, and I and through that, you know, then I got an American agent because mm. I again I thought, I mean, you just do your brain doesn't sort of work in that way. And I thought I'd make the film, I'd have this amazing experience making a feature film, uh, and then I thought I'd come back to London and I'd start carrying on <laughs> with music and trying to sort of carry on with the band, or, or you know, <laughs> and yeah, quite quickly I suddenly got cast in another film, uh, which was yeah with Scarlett Johansson and Natalie Portman. Yeah, and a whole the, bunch of sort of English yeah, actors. Yeah, the Berlin Girl, and then yeah. you're in, uh, that great movie, which I'm, 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 I imagine it was fun filming in Vegas, twenty one. Twenty one, yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have been fun, right? Because <clears throat> you're a young man, you just like you know, you just sort of broken onto the scene, and and you're filming in Vegas. I mean, I have a love hate relationship with Vegas. Yeah, I so mean, do I. Yeah, I, like I sort of thought I, I'd watched it on screen a lot of times and thought, like in twenty one, and God, <laughs> this is going to be amazing. I got I there, it's really hot and full of awful people. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm yeah. not sure I love this place as much as we were there for nearly two months. Oh yeah, so we, yeah, you should never be in Vegas for nearly two months. Two ever. days is how two long you need days. to spend. It's, it's the rule, Vegas, isn't it? I mean, right. that's kind of the long weekend is yeah. the rule. Yeah, yeah, and you start seeing the same people time and time again. You know, yeah. these sort of poor old women with the fag ash that's sort of like you know as long as a pencil because that's it like vegas is painted as really glamorous and when i went there i was like there's a lot of a lot of overweight people in velour track suits <laughs> sitting at the same slot machine I every know, day i know it it, is it's sad. sort of it's like this is not yeah we used I to thought. go to this pub in there's uh the casino the new york new york casino yes and yeah. in that casino there's an irish pub yeah. and it was as close to a sort of real pub as we could get <laughs> And you could sort of order a Guinness and a shepherd's pie. And if you sort of angled yourself at a certain angle, you could almost believe that you were in a sort of like, you know, Irish or English landscape. If you just blanked out the kind of... Noisy. Like, you don't realise how noisy it is like in those casinos. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you to again, talk about the people. You've got like Julie Taymor. You've worked with so many 
amazing directors. Um, Peter Weir, yeah, you work with on uh, The Way Back. I love that. I mean, I say I love that movie. It's like it's a it's a grim watch at times. It's a tough watch. But you're yeah. talking about working with them. Um, you know, the guy who did Witness, the guy who did Dead Poets Society, the Truman Show. Yeah. What that must have been quite something being directed by him. It was, and it was one of those films that was again. It was sort of, it was a sort of life experience. There's a few of them. Sometimes you make a movie and it's a film, and you have an amazing experience, and it's sort of work. And sometimes you do something because the story of the film is about a group of people who escape a Soviet labor camp yeah, and it's... walk on foot from Siberia to India. Yeah. So like, you know, making that film and being out in those landscapes and being surrounded by this nature in the way that they have to sort of survive and sort of get through. And learning all about these survival techniques that they sort of did to kind of stay alive, basically, was was an amazing experience. And yeah, having Peter Weir at the sort of helm of all of that, who's just the most sort of joyous, sort of infectious, you know, and he, he's just done so many amazing films. Yeah. And so wise and so beautiful with his energy mm. and so kind. And he was really our sort of inspiration to sort of keep going because it was tough. It was a really hard I bet shoot, it was. you know. I bet it was. We were all freezing in the snow in Siberia, and we all dreamed of getting to to the desert, which is where we, you know, where we obviously end up. We we're like, oh, you know, one day we're going to be in the <laughs> desert. It's going to be really hot, and it's going to be nice, and we're all freezing, just standing around buckets. With use that sun. energy. Use that. Use that in the performance. But you get to you get to the desert, and I was like, I want to go back to the mountain. <laughs> this is way worse. Way worse. The heat is so much worse than the cold. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't, you can put on another layer, or you can have a cup of soup, or you can do something. That, when you're that hot and there's just nowhere to turn, <laughs> and then we didn't have trailers that were anywhere near where we were filming. You know, uh -huh. we'd sort of get changed in the trailers in the morning, and then we sort of have to drive for sort of two, three hours into the middle of nowhere. Mm. And I realised that I didn't love wide open spaces like that, empty, barren, hot. Yeah, where you just can't see anything other than emptiness, and it and it made it made you feel quite weird, I have to say. I agree. Yeah, a very strange experience yeah. when there's just nothing. So I'm yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a snowman. I'm yeah. into I'm into being cold. Yeah, I've uh, yeah, I prefer I, I I prefer the rain to um to, yeah the to rain the sun. yeah yeah. It's, it's, uh, this is but this is me because I spend so much time watching movies. If I, it's sunny outside, I'm like, Guilt. you're an idiot. Yeah. Guilt, yeah, yeah. exactly. I have the same thing. I have the same thing. Yeah. So bring on the rain, I'm like, brother, yeah. <laughs> I can't go outside. Yeah. Um, well, to bring you closer to home, obviously, uh, you worked with Anne Hathaway on One Day, which mm -hmm. was um, uh, a movie that I really enjoyed. Um, uh, there's one thing I really, really enjoyed, but before I tell you what my thing is that I really, really enjoyed, it's part of your performance in that film. It, um, how did that come about? How did you get involved? Was that was that uh, uh, another meeting? Did you did you have to audition at this stage for it? Yeah, I had to do one of those chemistry reads. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, which was uh, yeah, I was asked to sort of read the script. It was weird because the book was sort of kicking around at mm -hmm. that time, and someone had sort of recommended it to me. I was filming at the time, and I quite like to read an easy book when I'm filming to take my mind off the work. Mm -hmm. You know, in in the evening times, people forget that there's so much sitting around in your job. Yeah, it's like, and so that, it's especially crazy. at the end of the day, we just want to sort of switch off. And so I was reading the book, and then I got sort of um, cast in the movie. And I remember thinking, "Oh, well, that's ruined the book for me now." Like, I, <laughs> I had this sort of vision Why? of who this character was. Because when you, when you're reading a book, you sort of have all these imaginations of people from your own life, and you sort of put these. You know, you you visualize the people in your own brain, so did and you I never re visualized myself. Do you but know when I mean? you f did, when you carried on reading the book, did you then visualize you in the role? Yeah, because I had. Yeah, <laughs> wow. suddenly it was like, oh shit! Oh, now it's me! Oh god! Like, <laughs> yeah, so that's that must be weird. <laughs> so, Halfway through this book, and suddenly you. Oh, that's that book ruined. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, it was it was weird. I sort of had to. I can't remember where we did that, and probably in Los Angeles again. And um, yeah, met with Anne. I remember I. She was late. I remember that. <laughs> And was super nice. And yeah, we had to do that sort of chemistry thing right. where, where you have all these producers and everyone sort of sitting around just watching, you know what I mean, to yeah. see if sparks are going to sort of fly. So, and when it's in a romantic sort of way, that's always quite, it's like a stressful first date where everybody's sort of watching. You know? Someone was telling me that like, it's very different, like auditioning in the UK compared to America. In America, they bring like everyone yeah, into the room. There's, there's a crowd. Like, tons and tons of people there from the studio, execs yeah. and everything. And you see them all sort of whispering, uh -huh. you know, what in the middle of your 
How do you deal with that? It must. It would terrify me. Like yeah. you must have to fight. You must have some sort of tools to just switch off. You just. I guess you do. You just have to sort of blank it out. But yeah, you sort of do the performance, and then you can just see a load of people sort of discussing, right? You know, in front of you. <laughs> but yeah. So then I, I, I sort of did did the auditions for that, and then yeah, a few a week or so, I think it was afterwards, I got the call. Quick turnaround that it then. Was, that it was all going to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was a big movie, wasn't it? I mean, I remember. Like walking around London and seeing that poster uh, on the side of a billion buses. It yeah, was like it was yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I liked him. Um, this is the bit I was going to tell you. The bit I really liked is um, your performance when Dexter uh, becomes a TV presenter in the mid 90s. <laughs> I honestly think that is such a spot on performance <laughs> of those TV. Because, like I said, we're the same age. And yeah, I felt yeah. like I'd seen that exact guy. On 90s TV. Yeah, well, we all watch those shows. At like The Word, for example. Two o'clock in the morning right. or whatever on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah, definitely spawned from a from a few different sort of uh, presenters that I'd seen along the way. Yeah, because you know, it was like, I remember, I mean, like The Word, obviously, was it was like, you know, we, it was early 90s, so teenagers, I th- we would have been when that was on. It felt dangerous watching that show. Like It was like, this is, ex- I shouldn't be watching this, yeah. but I'm watching yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, I miss stuff like that. I miss TV like that. <laughs> Yeah, I, maybe it wouldn't translate now. Maybe it would just seem so bizarre that like I think that's the case. Yeah, do you? I, I really think we we both look back because I spent for. Like, you don't think I would kiss my own granny is like <laughs> would fly these days? <laughs> that was. I'll do that, anything to be on TV. That's the that segment. I'll kiss my own granny. Oh, like, oh my god! Because this was before the behemoth that reality TV has become had sort of entered the fray. So this was like the first taste of what people would do. Yeah. To be on TV, kissing your own granny, other ones drinking set. your own vomit was definitely one of them. Yep, putting your feet in shoes full of dog shit <laughs> was one of them. Kids, you do not know what you're missing. <laughs> this, was, this was quality television. <laughs> there was one where a person had to sponge the sweat out of an overweight person's armpit and then squeeze it yes, out into their I mouth. I remember that. I remember that. Oh man, that was a <laughs> hell of a show. Hell of a show. Good though. old days. <laughs> But you saw, I, I, because I was always like, because like you, I remember like the word then later on, TFI Friday. Yeah, huge, it huge. Like, when I, you'd get the bands and yeah. they would come in, you'd be excited to see who was going to be playing yeah. on each week. And then, you know, that sort of being like a kid going, I want to be in the bar on TFI Friday. Yeah, That's yeah, my yeah, dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I sort of, I was one of those standard bearers for like, bring it back. You were wrong to, it would work again today. And then I think they brought it back a few years ago and I went, it doesn't work today. <laughs> I was wrong. This is not good anymore. It sort of, it was really weird. You sort of go, God, I wonder how much of the 90s that I sort of cherish as like, bring it back. Yeah, is maybe let's just, dated. it's best just left, left as it was with fond memories. Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> we're sitting here looking back at, at, at some of your films. Is it... Like I love doing this, obviously, but is this kind of a unique experience for you? Do you ever sort of look back at at some of the the films you've made and like your achievements and all of that, or are you sort of just constantly looking forward? Yeah, kind of constantly looking forward, I suppose. Yeah. I don't really. I mean, I sort of I think about them, or I wish I thought about them more. You know, and I sort of have these memory a memory will flash through my mind of sort of doing something crazy in a film, and you're like, oh yeah, that really happened. That was kind of crazy, wasn't it? You know? Yeah. Um. But yeah, I don't sort of go back and watch old films or sort of. Do you never watch your own films? I mean, I watch them at the time, right? You know, and sort of, you know, to, I usually watch it before a premiere, so because mm. you're going to obviously be talking about right. the film, and you need to sort of know what you're talking about, and if the film's awful, then you need to just be prepared for that, <laughs> or you know, just to have a sense of what the actual movie sort of is, because sometimes you can be making something you think it's one thing, and then it comes out, and it's yeah. it's definitely another thi- thing. I don't together. envy you on those press lines, you know, because you are thrown to the wolves at that point, yeah. for want of a better expression. So it's good to sort of at least have cast your eye over uh, it. Then I'd probably watch it at the premiere or something, and uh, then I sort of put it to one side, let it, let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you? Because I've often wondered, like, if it, if something comes on TV and you're like, "Oh my god, it's me in this," like yeah. whether you'd sort of sit down and watch <clears throat> it to the end, like. No, I haven't. Done. I've been in a bar once where it started playing on TV, and it was just really off-putting. <laughs> so <I was> sitting, <laughs> trying to have some food or something, and it's playing in the background. <laughs> um, another film that I have to mention because it's I, I absolutely love this movie. It was quite divisive, I think, with the critics at the time. But um, Cloud Atlas is. I think it's one of the most expensive independent films ever made. And it's, yeah. it's just such an ambitious film. Yeah. Um, what were your memories of, like, of being part 
of that um, experience? Because I imagine it was a quite a big experience being part of Cloud Atlas. Yeah, it was. It was like nothing I think any of us had ever made. <clears throat> and there's a you know a, a wealth of actors that were involved in the film, big Hollywood stars, more sort of English character actors, huge Asian actors, you know, big actresses from China and Korea, and it was just a huge melting pot of all these different sort of people coming from the industry from different places. And I think everybody, including Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, all those sort of bigger names, had never done anything quite like this. You mm. know, where we're all playing sort of four or five, sometimes six different characters in the film. It was all about playing, you know, playing around with makeup. And, mm. and there were sort of two film sets happening at the same time. So the Wachowskis directed one set and a guy called Tom Tickver directed the other set. Yeah. <clears throat> and they were both felt like the biggest films you'd ever been on. You know what I mean? <laughs> And you would sort of bounce between the two sets depending on what story you're, you're telling because you have six different stories in the film that all come together to sort of tell one big thematic sort of yeah. idea. But yeah, to play a, 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 a bunch of characters in one film is sort of kind of unheard of. And, and to be trying to achieve what the Wachowskis and Tom wanted to achieve, we had this, I remember really clearly we had this big sit down kind of show and tell that Lana and Lana Wachowski sort of, put together where she put all these images all over the walls and we all sat down and she discussed and talked to us about what she was hoping to achieve and i think all of us were just like wow this is something <laughs> totally different and it was nice because it put all the people from all their different experiences your tom hanks's and your it, it, we all felt like we we're all on the same playing field it all felt like this is our first movie you know it really so, and so it was a really exciting time actually it was a really amazing film to be a part of I bet it was. I mean, like I said, I think it's a fantastic film, and it feels like a a real labor of love for a lot of the people involved. Like I think I got I found a quote from Tom Hanks. I think he said something like, uh, uh, "It's a movie that altered my entire consciousness. It's the only movie I've been in that I've seen more than twice." Which is <laughs> it's great. I love the idea. Of well, Tom you Hanks. need to see it more than twice. You do because it's quite a lot to take in. Mm. And even for me, you know, obviously I'd read the screenplay various times. I've read the book a few times. I was a part of the conversations that you know with Lana and the filmmakers of what we were trying to achieve, and even then it was like it was still a lot to sort of piece together when you're watching the film, and then once you've got past all of that and you watch it again, you go, oh, it all kind of flows and makes total sense. You know? It's beautiful as well. It's a really it's a beautiful sort of sim film. symphony of sort of cinema that film in a way. I, wait, I mean, I, Hugh Grant said it himself, but I'm, I'm, he said <laughs> it's frustrating to me every time I've done something outside the genre of light comedy. The film fails to find an audience at the box office <laughs> and sadly Cloud Atlas never found the audience it deserved, which I, I you know, it is a real shame that, uh, you know, especially after the effort and like the amount of money that had been put into it and, you know, the, the, the love that uh, I think a lot of the cast had for the film, it is a shame it didn't reach a bigger audience, but it's still. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's, but it's one of those films, again, that sort of, you know, people that did see it and that felt connected to it really love it as mm. a movie, you know. Yeah. So it has a sort of special place in sort of some people's movie collection you know. it does it does mine <clears throat> and uh yeah uh now you have to do me a solid because um Go i on. i want to talk about geostorm yeah because uh i am i am a, a defender of geostorm i wrote a piece arguing <laughs> that geostorm uh doesn't get the credit it deserves right okay um now what what was your experience of geostorm because it is i mean it's fair, like it's all out there, the fact that it was it had its problems with reshoots and everything. But yeah. what was on the ground, what was your experience of Geostorm? Did you like being part of Geostorm? It was everything I imagined it was going to be, yeah. and it turned out to be the film I imagined we were making. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you knew what it was going to be? Oh, with. 100%, yeah. No, I mean, there was no, like, uh, yeah, I didn't think we were making some sort of important sort of uh, movie about climate change. Do you right. know what I mean? But I did sort of love that it had a backbone in that sort of world and it was saying something very specific about mm. the sort of world that we lived in, but I was fully aware of what it was going to be. <laughs> and that it was, you know, it's called Geostorm. I mean, what, <laughs> what, what, what do you think it's going to be? You know? Yeah, but it's great. I mean, there's some... You know, it's just, it was just a big... And it was. It was. It was I'd, I'd never been in a big sort of disaster movie, splashy Hollywood giant thing in that way, and it delivered that 100% for yeah, me. Yeah, and it's... 
You know, there's some interesting uh, interesting decisions, you know. Normally in those movies, the central romance is between, you know, a man and his wife and them trying to get back together and resolve something with the backdrop of this disaster. And uh, it's two estranged brothers. Yeah. Which is a it's a, a new angle on this. <laughs> this is... Getting over their sibling differences right. to, to save the good of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, your relationship with um, Abby Cornish, your character's relationship with Abby Cornish uh, yeah. in it. That's... There were some great people in it. I mean, Ed Harris, who I'd worked with before, right. he was in the Peter Weir film. Hmm. So we, you know, it was amazing to sort of team up with him again and do something completely different. You know, yeah. last time I saw him, his teeth were falling out and he was sort of, <laughs> you know, close to death, you know. And then the next time I saw him, we were all in smart suits in the White House, you know. So that's all the fun of it. Yeah. yeah. And Annie Garcia was in it, who I've always loved from afar, you know. So it was, yeah. it was. It was fun to do something ridiculous with some really serious actors. <laughs> you know what I mean? was... <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. You've got some real, you've got a really high caliber cast yeah. going. So there's a tidal wave coming now. <laughs> yeah, well, the car chase scene I did with Andy <sighs> Garcia, there's uh, a scene where we're sort of, you know, this giant car chase. And as an actor, you fall for that stuff every time because you read it in the script and you're like, wicked, this is going to be amazing. We're going to shoot this car chase scene it's going to be so thrilling it's going to be amazing i'm in there with andy garcia and abby cornish and you know waves are coming in and lightning bolts are striking and like, you sort of buy into the magic of it you know and then of course the logistics of it was just pure hell you know and we were stuck in this sort of gimbal car thing for three days i think we shot that where you're kind of like you don't know what's happening you're in a green screen box you're in some fake gimbally car that people are pushing around and moving and the director's just shouting like duck there's a lightning bolt coming from the left hand side turn around we're all just sort of you know you're with Andy Garcia who's a very serious and brilliant actor and you both just look as ridiculous as it feels you know if it makes you feel any better, <laughs> that car chase uh, is my favourite scene in the movie. There you go. The, I'm glad because yeah. it took three days. <laughs> <laughs> the bit where um, uh, she, Abby Cornish spins it and then fires at the yeah. people chasing her. Yeah. I was going to do a full uh, Steve Coogan partridge scene. And she's like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's good. Looks great. Just a total nightmare to I film bet. it. Yeah. I bet. Um, so but it's pretty much has done. What's next, though? I mean, obviously, you know, you shot this movie in New York. Is that when, is that something that you? Yeah, out that's to? a film. It sort of came up. Uh, I don't know when it's going to come out. I mean, we literally just finished filming that, and that was with uh, Katie Holmes, mm. who had written and directed the film. Oh wow! Yeah, and it's a film sort of about COVID and about the time and about sort of what happens to these two characters. It's sort of love story in a way that's sort of set amongst the COVID backdrop. And I was sort of really moved by it as a, as a piece of writing. And then I watched a film that she directed. It's, you know, Katie Holmes is not known for sort of being a director or mm. sort of being behind the camera. So I sort of wanted to see what she had done previously. And I was really impressed by a short uh, uh, independent film that she made. And so we spoke on the phone uh, on a Zoom call and I got on really well with her. We had a, a great conversation. So I agreed to sort of come over to New York and sort of shoot the film. And I was really excited about the idea of shooting a covid movie whilst this monumental thing was happening to us so we're sort of shooting what was it wasn't something in hindsight yeah. do you know what i mean it wasn't like oh we're going to shoot this thing now it's all over we'll start telling these stories it's like we're going to tell this story while we're in it at the time you know and that was really interesting to me and i was glad that we did it and i'm glad i have this sort of piece of work that represents this kind of crazy time that we've just sort of lived through and are still living through now, you know. Yeah. So for that, I was re it was a really interesting project to be a part of. And that's coming out sometime in the... So, yeah, we finished uh, just over a month ago, so it'll take the time it takes, I guess. So it usually takes about a year for the film to come out. Yeah. Oh, well, touch wood, we won't still be in this strange, I know, I know, weird yeah. reality. Lockdown, still watching movies. <laughs> I have caught up on a lot of movie watching. Yeah. <laughs> and I've watched, I think I reached the end of Netflix one day, which was <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> Can you reach the end of Netflix? <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, Jim, really, really good to have you in. Um, Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's been great. And Home Before Dark, as I said, uh, fantastic. Season two has just started on Apple TV Plus. Every Friday, a new episode drops. And it's, it's really great. I would recommend anyone watch it. Thank you for coming in, man. Thank you, Alex. Good to meet you finally, man. Hey, we've done it. Yes, we did it. <laughs> Cheers, mate.